We're going to be talking to uh, this panel that I mentioned before now, not least of which is Daniel Kennedy Clark from the O2, uh, Liam Boylan from Wembley Stadium. I think you've heard of these places. Sam Alden from the Roundhouse in Chalk Farm. Orden Thakilson from the Roskilde Festival in Denmark. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Pascal Bio from the Paleo Festival in Switzerland. So Chris, there's been so much that's happened in the last few months. Can you yeah. pick out some of the highlights from those that period? I can too, uh, but am I on? You are on. You can hear that's good, because it keeps <laughs> going on and off, sorry. Um, well, I think it's been quite a difficult time because so much has happened. A lot of misinformation, false starts, course changes in the way that the world sees the virus morph in our kind of psyche. Um, I saw one key interview on US TV where a guy called Anthony Fauci, uh, who's a big player in the, in the sports industry out there, replied to people wanting to start back major sports initiatives in the US, and he said, we don't control the timeline, the virus does. Which I think was kind of a defining moment, and it was fundamental to us all emerging fully from lockdown. Because as soon as the government makes some sort of statement, everybody interprets it just as they want to interpret it, rather than what the government are actually saying. Um, I mean, it's been very difficult because there's so many key questions which haven't been answered, and it leaves everybody confused and not knowing what to do. I mean, we've spoken to major venues, arts and cultural organizations, people dealing with counter-terrorism threats, and, and also the public. And it's clear that many are at a loss what to do with the constraints that are kind of put on them. In many cases, a major West End theatre may need 85 to 98% capacity to break even. And if social distancing gives them kind of 28% capacity, the cost of tickets becomes astronomical to make the show kind of wash its face. So we then destroy many years of careful development to where art and culture is now from the elitist forms that it used to be. Uh, and we don't want that to happen. And the problem with it is that drive and push is forcing us into a corner. I mean, in sport, behind closed doors, football started in many countries, and it's tempered by the difficulty to create a kind of atmosphere. Um, a vital part of the total experience is there. Um, even opening to socially distanced fans has been difficult to swallow because you can't socially distance when standing up to let others into a row. It's also difficult to remember what to do in toilets, changing rooms, and all other areas because we're social animals. In some countries, definitive answers have been given. Working with football clubs recently has been interesting because the amount of planning that goes into a behind closed doors game is immense. It's not just a rubber stamping activity. Today, however, we'll hear from our guests about all of the efforts that they are making to focus on the alternative normal. And we'll also hear from those in the audience with burning questions. But before we start, I'd just like to introduce the panel and ask them to say a little bit about themselves. Danielle. Hope you're okay. Good to see you back again. Hey, Chris. Uh, thanks for having me. Yes, I'm very well. Thank you. Um, sad I'm stuck in the tent today where it's a lovely uh, a lovely bit of um, sun outside. But hey-ho, I'm glad to be in the tent anyway. So, um, so, yeah, I'm Danielle. I'm the Deputy GM at the O2, and I look after all of the operations under the tent. That includes event management and production, um, guest relations, security, catering, transport, you name it. Um, if it's operations, um, then that's what I do. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Liam, nice to see you've managed to see a barber or get, it, get your hair cut, it looks pretty <laughs> smart. How are you doing? I'm very good. I have a, uh, a very talented wife, although I've got to admit I was uh, biting my nails all the way through that haircut. Uh, and again, I think it was the bit where she never showed me the mirror behind, so I'm never going to show you behind the head because God knows what that looks like. Um, we're, uh, we're good. Uh, we've, we've gone through the same rocky period as everybody else has. Um, so my job as the GM of Wembley Stadium, um, we got hit as everybody did through our calendar. And the one thing um, which we've got now coming back on the horizon is uh, games behind closed doors, which I'll go into later. Um, trying to be prepared for that and talking, getting the teams ready for what that was, was a case of ripping up the manual and starting again, because um, guidance, you know, where was it? You know, at that point to talk to people because nobody had done, um, actually delivered a game behind closed doors when we first started looking at it. So the, the team have been, a number of them have been put on furlough. Um, the teams that have been left, 
I've probably worked more hours than they've ever worked and it just hasn't stopped. You know, we've been incredibly busy uh, with planning and replanning and then replanning. As we all know, because things change every day, um, it means we have to change. And that one stroke of a pen somewhere else adds 12 hours of work to our guys to restructure again. So we're good, um, but it's been a struggle at times, but we're, we're ready for something coming in and our first event behind closed doors Monday and we cannot wait to get something going. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, good to see you back again. You've been in touch quite a lot over the over the summer with things that have been going on. So how how are you doing and, and what's going on? Yeah, hey Chris, good to see you all again. Um hi Toby and, and hi to um to the to the team who were was on the first webinar with as well. Um same really, you know, I oversee commercial and operations. Um so um I've got the commercial side that we're looking at, which of course at this moment in time isn't um isn't anywhere we're net where we need it to be. And then the operations side, so events, technical and production, um, operations, visitor services, health and safety all sits under me as well. So, I mean, I think pretty much the same as everybody else, you know, we've got um, we've got a lot of staff on furlough. So the people that aren't furloughed are, um, I mean, seriously, just doing the most incredible work. Um, we're busy. I'm, I'm probably working more hours than I was before, um, but, you know, so far, so good. A lot of anxiety, I think, about what the future holds. But given the circumstances, I think I think we're hanging in there. I think we're okay. Yeah, good, thanks. Good. Pascal, how about you? Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Pascal View. I'm head of Department um, Safety, Security and Services for Colleague of Islam in Switzerland. Uh, welcoming every year uh, 50,000 people per day during six days in the end of July, except this year. Um, so the activity is very down now, of course, but uh, as I am also associate researcher um, at the Laboratory of Urban Sociology at uh, the Swiss Polytechnical School in Lausanne, um, in the field of risk management, crowd analysis, um, it's, it's the other part of my activities and that's the main part today because there is a lot to think about, a lot to analyze, uh, regarding uh, risk perception, risk management, it's it's fascinating uh, in a, in an analysis point of view. But of course, operationally, it's very hard. <laughs> um, and uh, also, uh, I created an institute for education and consulting, whose known whose name is Issue, the Swiss Institute for Urban and Event Safety. And um, uh, I've been mandated. Uh, we will maybe uh, talk about this later on. I've been mandated by the, the, the French um, Association for Promoters uh, to help in the way to reopen venues in France. So um, that's, that's also a big challenge and a very interesting project. Thank you, Pascal. Morton, I've seen lots of pictures of you doing social distancing wine tasting on uh, Facebook, <laughs> which is pretty good. So how are you getting on? Um, I'm good. I'm good. We are not so busy. We were supposed to open the doors for our festival uh, on Saturday, but that's not gonna happen. This is our busiest season for the out of house business. We are not doing that much. So what we are basically spending our time on is trying to install, we have some museums, venues, a bar that needed consulting and how they can reopen. Um, we've done a lot of that, and today we are celebrating the graduation of some of the young kids of a business school who are doing a drive-in celebration with speeches and stuff like that. But actually, we get time to drink more wine and relax and enjoy the good weather. That's how it is with us. Thank you very much. It's been interesting here because Milton Keynes Bowl and Milton Keynes area we haven't done any concerts really there for years, and now we've got about 20 concerts coming, drive-in concerts. So something in the city is, is actually really working. So should be interesting to see how that works. Okay, I'd like to firstly go over to Danielle and ask her what's happened over the past months and how her team and the venue have coped with the virus. Um, so it seems like forever ago we were doing this panel. Um, while the time's gone really quickly, it's also been incredibly slow at some points because I think we're just all urgent to get back to what we do best and, you know, running events. So we've done quite a bit. It's been incredibly busy, like the rest of the team were saying. Um, most of our teams are furloughed as well. So 
there's only a handful of us that are kind of um, keeping the, the ship afloat at the moment. So one key thing that we did do is we opened our doors to the NHS. Um, so we had the NHS come in and take over the building as a training academy. So because we're just across the other side of the water to the Nightingale Hospital, um, we got through about two and a half thousand people in about a month training. So what would happen is they'd come to us first, um, get all of their key skills done. You know, obviously there's lots of volunteers as well that needed to go through training before they were actually deployed into the hospital. So that was really, really, um, you know, it, it was a challenging time actually. It, the, the, the NHS are absolutely fantastic, but they they don't work in our, you know, they don't work in our world. So there was a lot of kind of hand holding and guiding them through and helping them get to the best possible outcome, which we were obviously super keen for that to happen. Um, but it was great for the team as well, because they were able to get back to doing what they actually do day to day. And, and that's kind of operate this building. So that that was that took us um, from sort of April into uh, May. Um, they were only with us, um, you know, just over a month in the end, just because luckily, you know, the, the pandemic didn't require them to stay longer and with Nightingale being closed down now. So um, what else have we been doing? We have been writing opening plans galore, as you can imagine, um, writing them, changing them, interpreting the, uh, the the rubbish guidance that often is not available for us and, and kind of really just evaluating everything that we do so that when we can open, we can do it safely. Luckily, we have got some parts of the building reopened. So um, we were luckily, uh, lucky enough to open Icon, our shopping centre, our Icon, um, outlet shopping centre um, uh, last week. So that was very successful. Um, and actually, it's been really beneficial to kind of go through that process of opening that first, us understanding what we need to do in that sort of area in order to get to the point where we can reopen the arena and the rest of the, um, the building. So incredibly busy um people apparently do need a designer handbag at the end of this so you know great for them and they do need some like trainers as well so it's been fantastic i wasn't really sure how busy it was going to be so but everybody's just really keen to get out and is, is behaving very well with our oodles of signage and sanitizers about the place so so that's been great and we're hoping that we will be able to open up our visitor attraction up at the o2 you know in the coming weeks along with that new guideline guidelines that have come out um, and then some of the bars and restaurants will be coming um as well so it's all been going in phases it's all been happening um it has been like i say full on and mentally as well it's quite difficult juggling the the gray because we're the people that work in the black and the white so um we don't like the gray and um yes it's been it's been a tricky time but also very interesting as well you know just being at the point where we can make a difference now and get those things in place so that we can just get back open so so busy times i i i don't must uh looking forward to that time where we can actually go on holiday and have a bit of a break <laughs> Daniel, thank you. I was going to ask you about uh, rest and relaxation and whether stress is an issue, but perhaps we can come back to that. So, Daniel, we'll, we will come back to you later on. Um, <laughs> Liam, can I come back to you, please? Um, just for everyone's benefit, clearly we're joined by uh, representatives here on the panel from medium-sized venues, from Stadia and from green, Greenfield sites. But I'd like to ask Liam at Wembley, which everyone knows, um, the programme has been decimated completely. So what measures are being put in place uh, for future events on your calendar? Um, difficult, because um, I think everybody wanted to postpone their events, and that, that was the key thing. Nobody really wanted to cancel because nobody could foresee what the future would look like. I think when we all first went into lockdown and we got that first three weeks and then it extended to three weeks, everyone's thinking, oh, my God, it's going to six weeks, never ever realising that we'd, we'd be here this far down the road and, you know, approaching 100 days for, for, for us working um, away from the stadium and all the teams. Um, so when we're working with event owners, they, they're they also trying to project and forecast how that's going to look. And and it's a scary thing to try and forecast. So whilst a number of people move things into 21, there's still a nervousness about what 21 will look like. Um, we're obviously seeing things in the news at the moment when there's, uh, there's pressure on to try and bring in some form of crowd, uh, no matter how small or what that is. Um, but the truth is what that really looked like. And I think um, Chris alluded to that fact that 
whilst I can show static seating, if I could cherry pick and drop everybody in one by one and sit them in their seat and they didn't move and I'll remove them again, um, that's all well and good. But for the sofa to seat, you know, how the hell do I actually get them to those seats with all of that brush pass, with all of concourse movements, all those things. And it's, it's a really difficult task for the teams to do. So when we're dealing with the actual event owners to look at what that calendar would look like, to give them reassurance is almost impossible. You know, they realize the boat we're in and, you know, giving them, trying not to give them negative answers to say, look, we're, we're looking at every possible thing we can do. Um, so it, it's tricky. And then I think Danielle was spot on about the guidance. You know, we look to guidance to say, okay, what, 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 how do we, how do we approach this and what we're going to do now for stadiums? We have the sports ground safety authority who are civil servants, part of the government, um, and obviously all of us connected to DCMS, um, but they're really struggling to keep up with what they should do. When it first was announced about the lockdown and the, the prospects of games behind closed doors, the first thing the SGSA and the local authority said was, OK, there's no crowd, therefore there's no safety certificate applicable to this and there's no SGSA license. So we planned it as we would do for, say, like a company day when we have these sort of corporate days and trying to plan that way. Um, but they quickly came back on board because of pressures from elsewhere and said, oh, I'm sorry, no, the safety certificate now does apply. So then you turn back to them again and go, OK, so looking at that certificate, what elements am I now discounting and what am I proceeding with? What do you think? And that's what we're getting back from these guys. Now, fortunately, the team that I've got, um, I'm probably similar to the other guys on here, are amazing. And when I said earlier about ripping up that manual, they did just that, you know, they, they looked at everything. And I'd say for the first time ever, we were led by the medical team at the forefront um, because it was so important for the information those guys were getting. And they were they were on so many different committees and, and liaising with so many different venues that they literally put together the document, which then led us the operational side on, on the back of that. And it worked, it worked really well to a point that when other protocols started coming out, we were seeing something like a 95% alignment uh, against what other sporting bodies were doing because of these medical teams that have been talking to each other. And that's been the, the joy of this and the integral bit of us moving forward is if those guys had not been so close to each other and worked and that network had not worked so well, I think you would have seen so many different silos where in truth is if you actually look at what a lot of the sporting bodies are doing, there's definitely an alignment, and that's because of our teams and not necessarily because of the guidance of others. It's from the guys within. And Liam, can I quickly ask a question? Because Alex has just put something on the text chat saying, are you aware of any country or government that's created cohesive, cohesive and realistic mass gathering guidelines? No, there's. Um, we're, we're kind of watching when Pascal's talking about it. You know, we, we see things in the news about the French, you know, going to allow 5,000 in and things like this. Uh, we're aware of... Uh, Denmark and we're aware also Iceland are looking at it and, and I think the big thing was when we first looked at this the only guidance that was first out well not guidance the only document that really circulated was the Bundesliga document and everybody seemed to get hold of this Bundesliga document but the thing that our medical team quickly advised us on was that the environment around them was completely different and the way the virus was affecting their, their environment outside of their venues was huge difference to ours, so that we couldn't look at that document and just drop it into ours. Um, and that's been the problem. And I think when we've got all the continent and all the different um, operating procedures that are coming, look at our own in the UK. You know, we've got four different guides going out for the different countries. We can't even get a combined uh, joint um, guidance that's coming from England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales. You know, they're all different, and that's the United Kingdom. So when you drop in the rest of the the continent as well. You're trying to pick the best pieces and trying to see who's leading, but everybody's watching everybody else to look at what have you got, what have you got. Now, at a government level, I don't. Th they're obviously talking, but I think our industry have been superb at opening doors and sharing documents, and there's been no worry about me getting hold of documents and talking to people it's just been a really good community straight away in how we best approach this and we've we've definitely used that our research has gone to all of these other countries and all these other sporting bodies and everybody's been open with us so it's been good on that side so yeah there's not strong guidance um from above but i think the teams within our industry have led on this and have been excellent yeah i think liam you make a really good point early on there as well and that's about the medical staff, because if you think about what happened at the weekend on Friday, it was leaked that it was going down to a meter to the sun. 
the best newspaper you can possibly leak it to. So it comes out that we're now going to have a meter's distancing. Then Chris Whitty on television stated it's a meter with mask and other elements involved. But everybody now, because of the way it came out and it was produced, everybody now believes it's just down to one meter. It doesn't matter about any, anything else. And I think that's the problem the government have. They haven't listened to their medical scientists. And so what we're not getting is the truth about the virus. We're getting what we're going to do. And I think that's a very poor way of doing it. Sam, we've been in touch a lot over lockdown. Um, and you were involved in the last webinar on the 1st of June. Um, we explored the theatres, arts venues, all sorts of things, and how we're now going to try to drive that back. So what are the key points you learned from this? And, and what are you doing in preparation for return? Because your your venue is right in the center of the community is the place where people go to do arts to see arts to be part of the arts how are they finding it and what are the kind of things that you're going to do yeah um thanks chris we're in um, um the north end of camden in uh, in london and uh, just in the chalk farm area so our community is 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 at the heart of everything that we do and the specific people that I was on that webinar with on June 1st were um, Indu Rubasingham, Chris Nelson, and Kaya Stanley Money, who are also in arts and, and theatre. There were also a number of other people on, on the panel. But the one thing that I think we all learned from that was that um, something you've just mentioned, um, that the information coming through isn't the best guidance. Um, and we're really all in this together. We're all being hit incredibly hard. I'm planning for a future that, as Liam has said, we actually don't know kind of what we're planning for and how that future is going to look. And the bottom line is at the moment is that some smaller venues have closed their doors, possibly permanently. Others are on the brink and more theatres and arts institutions have mothballed and said they're mothballed for a certain amount of months. Some people um, in London theatres have said until spring 21. So the, heart, the whole arts, culture, and entertainment, sports, everybody involved with the DCMS, basically, we need urgent support, and we know this. It's just, but it, you know, is it, when is it, when is it going to be coming? And I think there was an announcement yesterday that came out that has caused a bit of confusion for us all, which is that from July the 4th, um, theatres and concert halls can open their doors. But the problem with that is, is that we actually can't open our doors and put on live entertainment. It's a little bit like saying we're opening an airport, but none of you can catch a flight. That's, that's what it means to us. And so for, for, for us as a sector as well, in that perspective, it's difficult to plan because you can open your doors, but people can't come in. And the same kind of issues, um, there was another part of it as well, actually, that relates a little bit to it, which was people can now go to places of worship but they can't sing. And so if you relate that guidance into theatres, et cetera, even music gigs, if people can't sing because of the risk of, I, I assume, spittle hitting people, then, you know, wh where do we move forward from here? So the key points from that is driving arts back into the community and, and we're, we're working on our remobilization strategy and getting lots of best practice. Liam said about the sharing of information has just been incredible and we're really, really feeding into that and we're involved in a lot of different um, webinars, um, task forces, uh, community meetings, et cetera, et cetera. I think a big fear now is that we're all doing our best to recover and reopen, but the furlough scheme is winding down. So we're trying to work on getting gigs, live events, private, private events, um, sporting activities, our personal creative program at the Roundhouse back up and running and ramped back up, but we don't know when that's going to be. And so we can't plan on when our staff are going to be available, etc. So, and from speaking to Indu, Chris and Kaya, they're in exactly the same position as well. So it, it's, it's difficult. Um, Remobilisation, planning, planning, planning is the best way to, to be just like People have been working with their medical providers. We're working with Shosek, who are a crowd management provider, um, who've been brilliant with us and working on how we can reopen for either a private event or a gig or a theatre style show. And um, because they've all got different demographics, different ways of working, different capacities, different 
um, permeations of how we're going to look. So um, the key points really is to keep planning, preparing um, as best we can really, Chris. Sam, thank you. Um, gosh, there's a degree of frustration I can sense there, and it's understandable completely. Let's switch now from venues uh, like uh, Sam has just described to Pascal and to Morton uh, on huge uh, greenfield sites. Pascal, first of all, to you. You run a huge greenfield site. Sadly, you've had to cancel uh, this year, and you're looking forward into next year to see what you can do. What has the pandemic taught you, uh, and, and what have you changed in your planning structures to facilitate future mm. festivals? It's a very good question. Um, we, we are into the lesson learned process, actually. <laughs> um, uh, it's obvious that uh, our, our timeline is fully disturbed by, by the situation. Uh, like so many others, our, our festival uh, have been cancelled. Uh, that's a major uh, rupture in our work organization. We are so used, you know, to an annual process, uh, preparing the festival all year long running it operationally and then doing uh, doing a, a deep debriefing to identify what, what went wrong and good and so on and at that point uh, we are trying to reorganize our vision of this process uh, thinking about starting the preparation for the 44th edition uh, 45th edition for paleo for 2021 uh, but without any feedback from the last edition and that's uh, completely new for us, and that's quite difficult, I must say. Um, in addition, we are still fighting with our um, uh, with uncertainties about the future. We don't know um, what the sanitary conditions and prevention measures uh, we will have to put in place to be allowed to reopen or to start uh, the festival for next year. Next year. Um, we are still waiting for confirmation about the financial support that we could get from the, the government cover uh, part of our losses. Uh, so it's a period of strong ref reflection in a strategic level, I must say, uh, for all festival managers. It's, it's a risk that uh, the, the whole uh, biotope uh, of festival will be um, very, very will be would change next year. Maybe not next next year, actually, but uh, in the following two years, um, because uh, without some festival uh, have so so their that ticket, so they have some income to prepare the next edition, but they will not have this uh, for for the next year. So it's it's very important to look at the situation in a strategic level and uh, to. Uh, anticipate the the consequences but well to to be positive with uh, we must uh, also say we are doing our, our best to keep the staff awake with uh, the festival project giving some news um trying to enhance the community feeling between us uh, for example just uh, an interesting one uh, i developed my skills in online materials and uh, recorded short video uh, of e-learning based on previous incident occurred during the last uh, 15 years of the festival, uh, coming from my memories and uh, arch archives, and it's it's a really nice uh, it's really nice to remember the past, you know, to look uh, uh, together through the future. Pascal, thank you very much indeed. And Morton, uh, tell us more about that. Uh, Pascal mentioned period of reflection there for Ross Kilder. What does it mean? Well, I will say. Firstly, for us, I think the, the whole knowledge sharing is very important. We are a member of the yes groups like uh, Gallus and Chris uh, one of the front guys here. Um, and for us, we meet every Friday actually to discuss the situation and get some some knowledge sharing and ideas from each other. The fact is, at the moment, we are not really looking at what's going to happen next year. I had a meeting yesterday with the police. And they basically didn't want to look into next year yet. We have a major event next year in North Copenhagen. Uh, we're going to do World Pride and run the for that. And and they were like, yeah, maybe we should meet in September. Because they don't know. And and we see at the moment that we keep on coming out with new guidelines, new ideas, always change. Um, and it's very difficult to look into what's going to happen for a major festival like ours. 
So I will say one of the things that has become very important for us is the knowledge of actually being a charity organization as we are. We are first, and firstly, we are a charity organization, and secondly, we are a So I think that's one of the healthiest things for us to go back to our roots from the 30s and see what is it we actually want to do. Well, we want to help young people, so we need to make sure that we have other ways of making money to give away um, in case of stuff like this. Thank you, Martin. That, that, it's it's really interesting. I mean, I understand what you're going through because um, I'm just ready to pack my stuff for Roskilde now because we were, we were going to do a project there this summer again yeah. for the kind of 15th, 16th year. And um, just no festivals in the summer is, is just such an unbelievable thing and it's it's very difficult to take. But, but thank you for that. Danielle, you manage the UK's iconic arena. With the pandemic, do you think it's damaged the credibility in the marketplace or do you think it's had really positive benefits for you? Um, it's a really hard question because I think we probably won't know that exact answer until probably, you know, we're getting to the end part of the pandemic. But I think initially there was probably... A bit, there was a fine line and it could have gone either way. Um, as, as for our buildings, we are guided a lot by the promoter and their decisions. And so, for instance, when events are cancelling and you're at the point where you need to do refunds or you need to communicate to the incoming customer that the, the gig is now not in May, it's going to be the following May. If you don't get those communications right and you get it right first time, then yes, it could be very detrimental. And I think the vast majority of things we've communicated really well to our customer and we've told them as much information as we know at that time and, and we've done the refunds when we should in a timely fashion and, and all of those sorts of things. But there are those occasions where those events just ran on a bit too long when people just wanted an answer. And I think that could have a bit of a detrimental impact on us initially. But I think it's quite short lived and I think people understand it and people, you know, are able to move on. I, I think as an industry, we've been really good and we've collaborated really well, like Liam and, you know, Sam and everybody else has said. We're sharing the information. We are super keen to get back to, to the day job. And I think, you know, the customer knows that. Um, I think the major hurdle we will have is getting back to some form of operation and we only have one opportunity. The first impression counts and if we don't get it right first thing then we, you know more for us to be honest with you and, and, and we will definitely feel the, the impact at that point. It, you know it's a similar situation to after the horrendous quote, um, terrorist attack in Manchester that urgency from the customer of what they expected the venue to do was just so you know so at the forefront of everybody's brain and it's going to be exactly the same at the end of the pandemic if we are not communicating what we're doing if we're not taking the right measures if we don't get it right first time i think that's when we could really see the impact on our industry but at the moment i think we're doing an okay job daniel thank you uh, first impressions that's a key point so it's hard to keep up, I guess. But Liam, can I come to you? You're a pretty resourceful chap uh, and a legend, I think, last time I, uh, you and I spoke, uh, certainly from someone in the audience. If there's a bright side to the pandemic, uh, I'm, I find, I'm trying to find one. What other projects have you been able to work on whilst this has been going on? And how are your teams coping with it? Um, Projects-wise, um, I'm sure everybody's had, uh, I'm counting one million and three different um, presentations from LinkedIn on, and this is the product that you need to take forward to get us out of this virus and um, to, to deliver events. Uh, but do you know what? The thing is that the amount of things that do come through, there are, there, are, there are a few nuggets in there, so you have to go through it. So we actually set up a team just to go through all these documents. We weren't just watching them coming and just discounting them because we, we had to review it because this was new and it was a, a case of looking what we're going to do. Um, for example, within the um, football industry, um, it's standard these days to do a pat down search now when people are coming in part of your normal ground regulations and the counterterrorism side of it. But post COVID, you can't do that. Um, so you're not going to be able the one thing we're not going to be able to do is do a pat down. So we still need to look at what the solutions are. So the teams are looking at everything from mag arches to whatever else can do, do on the screening. 
Um, we also have our, there's a company who works with us, CrowdSafe, and those guys are helping us with um, our normal instant reporting and uh, payroll and all that side. But chatting to those guys, because they're developers, it was a case of like, okay, we, we can see all these proposed solutions coming through. What, what should we be looking at? So they've actually expanded and became something venue pro. And what they've done is they've got, they've gone into facilities management side of things because everyone's looking at what do you do from your facilities management, from your cleaning regimes and all that. So it's really important to start to really study that. And that's what we started to do is that rather than, as Danielle just said, get hit by that runaway train when someone says, right, and open, um, you have to be really prepared. For that. So the team have really looked at it uh, and worked closely with the guys. Um, the teams also have been, they've been very, very good at taking on extra coursework themselves. So whilst they're on furlough or even just a bit of downtime, they're, they're more highly qualified than they've ever been. Um, so they've gone out there. There was quite a number of free courses. So they've expanded in the health and safety side of things. Our health and safety manager managed to get hold of courses that they could do. So they have occupied themselves. They've not just all been sunbathing, which is lovely to hear from my side. Um, and then even to a point of my assistant, um, Charlie, strangely took up knitting. Now, kind of, Charlie's only in her mid-20s, so for her to take up knitting was strange anyway. But the only reason why I thought this was that my budgets are getting cut everywhere, so my team needs to be prepared to be in some Aaron sweater as a new uniform by the time we get into the winter, because... I think that's all I can afford. Um, so it is difficult on that side of it, and it's it's readdressing the budgets. And it's it's being careful not to allow certain budgets of strength, so from your training budgets, for a CFO to quickly try and slash them because that looks like an easy hit. And it's trying to get through to them that we're going to need this and we need to do CPD. And we can do a lot of CPD whilst we're in lockdown. And, and the teams are doing exactly that. But when I got on the other side of it, there's going to be new skills that they're going to have to be aware of and they're going to have to pick up really quickly. So I need the team to be prepared for that. So that's what they've been doing. So they've been, they're not just waiting for those doors open and deliver the same products because the same product's not there. We know that it's not there. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of it will stay the same. A lot of it has to stay the same because we still need to offer that escapism for, for people, especially after they've been in lockdown. They need that escapism. And that's why that desire is there. But they're going to look for those safety measures, which I've mentioned before. They're going to look for what are we doing to make them feel safe. And in exactly the same way, post-Manchester and post-whatever terrorist incidents we've had, our industry quickly looks at how do we make the customer feel safe to come into our venue? Because that's the only way they're going to come back. And you have to address that quickly. And that's the same with COVID. It's what are you going to do to improve your delivery that makes them feel better, makes them feel they want, to, look, they want to go, but they will be nervous. So you need to show we're doing this. You don't need to be nervous. This is how we're addressing it. Liam, on that point about courses there, Catherine has an interesting question. Um, can you share any information about free health and safety courses that you're aware of? It's a struggle yes. to find it. No, we we did. We found them. So um, I'm happy to deliver back after this. Um, I can feed back into you uh, what the courses were. So our uh, health and safety manager managed to get, there's a few that came on LinkedIn. So again, somebody came through to us and said they're doing free health and safety courses. And they're kind of like an IOSH sort of equivalent that was going out there. But it was great. And, and the guys did it. And it was quite intense. It was an online course. Um, so it wasn't frivolous in any way. And the team really had to study on it. Well, it was delivered really, really well. So, yeah, I, I will definitely send you the details that you can pass on to people. Brilliant, Liam. Thank you. And Catherine, you heard that there. So, Chris, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Liam, for being so candid. That's, uh, it's really good to hear the kind of both sides of it, both the, the physical element and the psychosocial things you've been dealing with. But Sam, your venue is medium size. Um, kind of what are the key areas of focus for you when you start up again? Have you worked through some strategies? Uh, have you linked things to risk to help regenerate? Um, and be even more the key focus for your community. That, yeah, that's right, Chris. Um, and actually, community is at the heart of everything we do. We work with so many young people, and, and that's what our, uh, you know, the Roundhouse for Charity is really all about. Um, the, the gigs and the events, that's where our income screen, screen uh, comes from. That's, um, that, that stream is important to us because it's that commercial side that, that feeds the work that we do with young people. We've launched Round Your House, um, which is it's basically um, online and it's for our young people. That we, we offer young people um, some things really unique in that we occupy a space between education and employment. And that really helps young people. It helps transform their lives. So at the moment, we've closed. Um, 
And that's been one of our biggest concerns from a young people perspective, because with our doors closed, with our studios closed, which is what um, we open for young people to, to express their creativity or learn different skills, where were our young people going to go for support, basically? So we changed our offer. We changed the way that we could stay in touch with young people. Um, we're offering pastoral advice um, via the email and phone, as well as our online resources. Um, and we're giving people as much as we can the, uh, the tools to be creative from their homes, hence the round your house um, approach to, to things. Um, it isn't the same, of course, as actually being on site and being in our incredible studios. But we felt it was really important to facilitate a creative outlet for the young people that we work with. So we're still managing to work with our community that you've mentioned. We're still maintaining that focus. Um, and it's gone down absolutely incredibly. There's, um, well, I'm going I'm to give it a shameless plug here. There's, there's one bit called, um, <laughs> uh, for, which, is, which is some of the homework. And um, it, it's, you know, it's had so many hits online. And I don't think it's just from young people. It's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's great. It's, um, it's something really cool to look at and to look into. So, um, so we've managed to maintain that focus. When we reopened, the key focus for us, I think, is really as much as possible um, with everybody, with all of us. It's, it's, getting, um, it's getting visitors back in through the doors, making them feel safe. And the strategies that we are building around that will be um, also tied into our young people because they're our visitors as well. So, yes, we, we have looked at um, our strategies. We've looked at the risk associated with those. We're still looking at them. I think it was Danielle that said, you know, Danielle, I think you said words to the effect of, you know, you've, you've changed your strategy a number of times, you've rewritten it or re-looked at it, and we're doing exactly the same as the, the landscape changes, as guidance changes. And as we get more information from um, different people within not just our industry, but different industries as well, um, whether it be the hospitality industry, there's some people in, in, in the, some restaurants that are doing some really good work, and so we're learning from as many people as we can. Sam, thank you. I love that round your house. I love yeah, that. Great. And you're looking after your your neck, your future audience. So that's uh, even better. Thank you. Um, Morton, can I come around to you, please? Um, your company doesn't just provide security and crowd management services for Ross Kilda. You've got a range of events that you're involved in. How has the pandemic affected this area of your work? And, and are there any lessons learned and good practice that you can see back to the audience? Like that, right? I, I think it's similar to what Sam was talking about about activation of staff, people. We don't have them shows. We have a few here and there, but they're really small, like the drive shows. When normally we would activate I think, hundreds at the moment of our, uh, staff that are um, kind of volunteers, they're doing it because they really want to be part of this. It's, it's instead of playing football, they are going to start management. So, so that's quite important for us to actually activate them. So we're trying to run different events that are things for them. Um, so next, next week, for example, we're doing a, a, a focus on our accident that happened 20 years ago. So we are having um, an evening where one of the survivors of the accident is coming in to tell us about how uh, he experienced it. Um, but actually, it's, at the moment, we are not doing that. So what we're trying to do is, is training for our staff, but also external training. We see now that the host part is being so important for venues, uh, museums, theaters, stuff like that, because it's going to be very difficult when we restart. And your staff is going to be so important. So they have to understand what are the challenges of COVID-19? Why are the guidelines like they are? What's the psychological part of the uh, you're not supposed to gather more than this amount of people um, and they have to be really good at conflict management because people might be scared or confused or not satisfied the new stuff and that's what the staff is supposed to handle it's going to be a completely new thing when we restart so the training of both is is one of the things that we're looking at a lot and assisting different venues with and then, as you guys said, rewriting plans for venues, even though they're not working at the moment, at least can start looking at how we be ready to start. But actually, now in Denmark, a lot of the 
venues are asking the government to force close all venues until the end of the year. So if you're not a very small venues, it's not going to be uh, possible to open to 10% of the audience where they're supposed to do like Liam said, you're going to be in the event seated out again. That's, that's not possible. So it's going to be an issue. Uh, so we are, we're trying to help out. We're trying to work with the uh, associations in Denmark about how we can help each other, how we can share knowledge, um, write the guides to how to understand the, the actual guides from the government because they are not so easy to understand sometimes. Stuff like that. But it is challenging that it's both part of our industry that's actually closed. And we have now that my I have the full time staff members that they are sent home from next week. And I will see them again by the end of August. So that's gonna be weird. Not even uh, having my own staff around is gonna be weird. We started with all the volunteers and it's direct staff. So it's gonna be immediately on. Thanks, Morton. That's 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 been, must be really difficult with all the changes that are going on and the fact that people can see no end, um, even though things are getting slightly better. But thanks for that. Pascal, you talked a little bit earlier about the French Promoters Association, PRODIS, and getting venues and festivals back to some form of normality that you've been helping with this. So what issues are they facing as a promoters association, uh, given not only the virus implications, but the past elements of terror attacks on the city? The event industry. Um, um, doing more than uh, security interviews uh, with even managers, uh, even safety experts coming from musical, cultural uh, and sport uh, field to share information about the situation and to find the best strategy to inform the, the decision to be made by the authorities. Um, and the, the main outcome, the key point is, uh, um, is social slash physical distancing. Um, to, trying to sum up uh, the situation today, we, we are still at the moment under a strict, strict sanitary vision of the risk. Uh, and from a medical and epidemiological, epidemiological uh, point of view, uh, physical distance is the key point to mitigate the risk. Uh, therefore, we are obviously facing a deadlock to manage uh, social and physical distance for, for even that attendees. Um, so the question is, or to rethink uh, the situation to be able to find the, the same way to minimize the risk uh, while providing acceptable conditions for promoters and venue managers to restart the, the activities. Um, and I think you're right. Um, there is a lot of similarities with the situation after Bataclan uh, or after Manchester bombing in 2017. Uh, suddenly, nothing else matters than uh, counterterrorism or uh, COVID-19, and this completely fades any other risk. Um, mm -hmm. And in my opinion, the only way to achieve um, this goal is obviously to build an exhaustive risk management approach, not only considering the sanitary principles, but also the even context, of course. And um, we, we must be able to tailor uh, adequate risk mitigation strategy with the event environment in general and with each project in particular. So in a very pragmatic way. Uh, and yeah, I think it's crucial for our industry to be able to assess the risk in order to tailor the prevention measurements then. Um, otherwise, we, we will just take measures uh, in the short term without learning anything. Uh, because uh, I, I agree, all the guidance, there is a lot of guidance in France uh, nowadays for each sector of the, um, uh, the cultural field, but it's always the same, uh, as I said, um, sanitary vision, and it doesn't fit with the, con the context. So there is a lot of protocols, very general, and now we, we need to go deeper into the context and to maybe to, to find some uh, sanitary prevention plans, but yeah, uh, um, linked to a strong risk management process, risk assessment, and the 
taking into consideration what you you know chris uh the the space available and the way people behave in the space so finally um regarding motor more than uh, examples it, it's very interesting to see all some knowledge um, and expertise available in the field of crew management are very useful to find solutions of uh, sanitary issues and, and problems. Pascal, I think thanks. it's a good lesson and it's a good point for us, uh, by the way, because I, as, as a crew management expert, we can say, uh, yeah, we, we our, our point of view uh, has to be uh, taken into consideration at the same level as uh, sanitary experts. Pascal, thank you very much indeed, and that's an interesting point. Uh, Daniel, perhaps you could follow on from now. We heard about planning there. Daniel, what, in, there must be some, I tried to get something out of Liam there, some bright lights on the horizon in terms of uh, the, the pandemic. Can you give us a little preview, uh, if you have one, of, of what you've been looking at in the future and what you're planning uh, over the lockdown period? Yeah, so, um, I do, you know, I do think that there is bright lights at the end of this. I absolutely know that this industry will, will bounce back. It will take some time. Um, but people love live events. So, you know, whether that be sport, theatre, um, festivals, I think everybody will be absolutely chomping to get back to it. It might just take some time. Um, and looking at our diary, and I, and I know, you know, speaking to all of the other arenas through the National Arena Association, we don't think that it will take forever. We do think, you know, within sort of 18 months, we would hopefully be back to sort of pre-COVID states within our, our diaries and our calendars, as long as we get it right. Like everybody has said today, if we make the best impression um, when we first open, I think we will be able to coax people back into coming out. And while there's been some, you know, lean towards all us, all these things happen digitally and we've all seemed to adapt it quite well to it, you, a live event is just not the same through your screen. It doesn't matter what sort of sound system you've got. But it's just not the same. Um, so, so I, yeah, I, I think from, from sort of quarter two next year, our diary is looking exceptionally busy. You know, we, yes, we've moved everything out, but there's never there's never a conversation of it not coming back. You know, yes, we have the conversation and we've probably moved, you know, a, a gig now I've moved probably four times already. Um, but it is moving back. It's not going forever. And 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 we will struggle with some, some demographics, I think. You know, there will be some nervousness maybe with the with an older, sort of more mature demographic who just have that anxiousness about coming out in general. Um, but we will do the right thing and we will get our customers back. And I think as a as an industry, you there's nothing out there that gives you that sort of feeling than a live event. And it, you know, you hear people now just chomping to get back to to, to watch their favourite team. Um, and, you know, Liam saying is, is his first event behind closed doors is on Monday. Now, it won't be the same, but it's something, you know, and some, something that everybody's aware that there's going to need to be a ramp up. So I am I know that, yes, it's a little bit dark and gloomy at the moment, but I can't think that that's going to be forever. And I know that that feeling of wanting to get back to a gig or to a live event is just there in somebody's brain now and and they want to do it and they're keen they're ready to go so much so who who thought that you could have as many drive-in events that they're about to go in that people are quite keen to sit in their car and listen to it through a radio like what a horrendous idea you would have thought a, a little while ago but now we're like yes a brilliant idea why wouldn't we want to do that and sit in the 30 degree heat in our car and 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 you know not have a bar near me but yes it's a brilliant idea let's do it so I, so i think that just that sheer determination of people they will come back and 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 that for me is just well that's my light at the end of the tunnel at the moment that's keeping me going thanks daniel that's brilliant um liam to continue with that point i mean milton Keynes is like the place to be this summer with all of those driving shows i've looked at how they're going to space it all out and what they're going to do and how are you going to be able to stand around your car as well which is quite interesting if they get away with it but you know, we've seen this driving shows from Live Nation across Europe. Now we've seen new companies coming out doing driving shows. Okay, the smaller bands, but I think Daniel's right. People will go because it's live music. And actually, at the end of the day, it's not really about the show. It's about everything around it. It's not just about the artist that's on. It's they just want to be there. They want to be 
taking it all in and doing something that's different. And I think that novel ideas is, it's quite interesting. So where, where are we at the moment? Have you any ideas on the new or alternative normal holds for us at events? It's, it was really interesting watching that whole thing with the driving. And I think the thing that strikes anybody who's in the industry, we know it's not a profit making idea because, you know, for, for what you've got set up for that and then for that capacity, it's not there. And, and what they've done, which is really clever with Live Nation, is they're keeping it current and they're doing exactly what Danielle said. They're putting it into the mindset of people, you know, that we have not gone away. You know, we are coming back. We keep seeing all these horror stories about the West End theatres and, and, you know, will they make it out the other side? And it's really scary to watch. So I think it's really important for the entertainment industry to show that we do have alternatives. So, and we're similar, we're kind of looking at, okay, moving the calendars one thing and trying to fit it all in. But I think we have to sweat the asset more. I think we, we as a stadium can no longer rest on the laurels of, well, we've always done this and this will come back. It's a case of looking at what else can we use the stadium for and what else has been that people have proposed in the past. And I think Danielle's hit the nail on the head that you just discounted and you just thought, don't talk to me, that's absolute nonsense. It's not nonsense now. It's an event and it's something that gets people back in. So we're talking to more and more people of that, you know, how can we utilize the stadium? You know, unfortunately driving doesn't work for us. I did look at it, trust me. And it just, we just can't fit enough in on the pitch. Um, but you are desperate to find something in there to show people and you kind of want to put the flag up to go, we're still here. We're not going away. And we are looking forward to bringing you all back in. So you sit down with the team more and more just to look at that, what that is. Um, it, it's just too important just to, to ignore and just to, to wait for somebody to press the big button to say, okay, you can go now. You need to push, okay, what can we do differently? And if it is a smaller event, uh, when we are allowed to bring in some form of crowds, what works? You know, because by the time I've worked out how to get them in the stadium, it's looking at the event that will entice people back and they want to see. So yeah, we're, we're far more open and we're talking to more people than we did before in the past because live industry is too important to us. And we, I think everybody on this call knows we're just too desperate to get it back and we want it back in some form. And we will we'll look at that, whatever that form is, uh, and then gradually build to back to where we were. Uh, and that's the key of it. But I think when we do get back to where we were, we don't ignore these people that helped us get back there, you know, because there are people that have got some excellent ideas and we need to embrace them more and just bring them into the family more than they were before. Liam, can I ask you something about that? Caroline's got a, a question about brand. Are you worried about your brand? I guess not. No, I'm not. I'm not worried about our IP personally. You know, we obviously have our partners and we have to look after those. But I think these are the bits that um, that's why I've, I've I've doffed my cap to Live Nation. It, it's a clever move because it's about the brand and keeping it current. Um, and we're the same. So the behind the closed doors is not what we would have ever wanted, but it's at Wembley Stadium. And then when it's on TV, it's Wembley Stadium. So it's pushing the brand to show we're still alive, that we're not one of the horror stories that have gone away. Um, and, and we have to do that. We have to stand and shout very, very loud because there's a lot of noise out there and there's a lot of negative noise and you have to shout louder than that negative noise. And that's the bit. And be happy when you've got the events, whatever type they are, embrace them and really promote them because you're promoting yourself. So, yeah, we'll, we will keep shouting very loud. Brilliant, Liam. Thank you. That's a very positive view there. Sam, can I come to you and talk about the thorny issue? Um, are there any ways to offset funding problems that you'll inevitably face? And if not, what can you do to make your venue work? Yeah, thanks, Toby. Similarly to Liam, we're looking at what different options might be available in terms of what can we use our spaces for. So we're looking at now is can we put um, filming? Um, can we do rehearsals? We're hoping to live stream some gigs in the meantime um, and, and start using our, our venue for that. We're also fortunate that we've got a number of different spaces. Um, we've got our main space, which is obviously our biggest space. But we've got other spaces so actually we might be able to um as well as our studios um move our young people into um being creative and artistic in some other spaces as well so we're looking at that in terms of funding problems um there, there has been um, an arts council emergency fund which has been open to 
some organisations, and we're um, we're awaiting a decision on that funding by the end of this month, so literally five days. Um, and I know that some other organisations may have access to to different pots, etc. Um, I think what we've been doing as a as a huge industry, and we've mentioned earlier about working with the DCMS, is to really talk about our um, arts, entertainment, leisure, sports as a whole, which has been brilliant because I think it's really enabled people to see actually what what we bring, and also not just what we bring for people in terms of entertainment or, or culture, but also what we bring to the economy as a whole. When you get a um, an arts organization, a theater, a stadium, um, a, a, an arena, et cetera, et cetera, actually it brings a lot to the local economy as well. And I think that we've really been able to highlight that. And, and actually a lot of local economies have been highlighting that um, on our behalf as well, because they've suffered. So I think for us continuing to uh, highlight how we can support each other, how we can be, you know, really work as um, um, a symbiotic um, kind of culture. Um, Liam touched on people who've had great ideas and um, including them in the future. And I think it's been fantastic the way that we've all worked together. I think that has been a real shining light, the way that everybody's come together, shared information. And um, I think if we can maintain that in the future, I think, you know, arts, culture, leisure, entertainment, sport, I think I think we do have a bright future. I agree with Danielle on that. I think we really do have a bright future. We've got to get through now and we've got to get through it the best that we can and open up our eyes and, and ears to things that we can do differently. But once we've done that and as we start to recover and rebuild, um, I, I think that I think that, you know, we, we'll have something really unique that we can that we can offer. Um, the funding is the issue at the moment. And I think as long as we can be as creative as possible and um, plan and prepare as much as we can, um, then then hopefully we, we can move forward. Okay, thanks for that, Sam. It's really, really good. Um, Morton, big question now. Could Ross Kielder take another hit like this year? And what's your business continuity plan to help to support it if the festival had something similar happen to it again? Because it's not just about COVID-19, this kind of thing, is it either? It's about any pandemic or any big crisis. So it may not be something like that next year, but what if something was to happen? What would you be able to do? What would your plan be? I will say that in the beginning, it's we don't know because we don't know how much this means for us, and we won't know by until by the end of the year because we don't know all of the health speeches from the government yet. We don't know of it, but we don't know if they see it the same way as we do. So we don't know how much funding we're gonna get back, um, so we don't know how much it is. Um, I think it would be difficult if we were not allowed to run next year. On the other hand, I would also say that there's a huge support uh, around our organization and festival. Um, and this is more than just uh, health, it's also financial and political. So I think as a support, so I don't think we are worried about that. Our business continuity management style on this is to run another company where we sell out of house. Uh, it shows at the moment it's not a big uh, help, but, but that's kind of the idea. Uh, so, of course, we will have to look into next year, and I agree with Danielle, next year we will be busy, unless they continue with not being allowed to gather, I think we will be allowed, and and then we will be busy. So, I, we we kind of agree that now we're going to get on this side of this festival, now we're going to close down for the summer, all of our staff will be sent home, and all of the management will come back in August, and then we will really look into strategies and business continuity and organization and whatever it needs on the other side. So we kind of say we have some time. And since we don't know that, uh, we don't think that we would be busy in, in our company where we're building out of this, because the venues won't suddenly start on September 1st. So we will still have some time in the fall to realize what we do. Um, we are running a festival, actually. We do have a lot of quality here very much forward on july 4th we're going to have a skill festival do it yourself um, which is pretty cool so you can buy a wristband and, and, and you can run your own festival at home which i personally all of uh, our friends gathering and running up 
type of streaming console from earlier years from lots of people just get stuff like that, right? Uh, but actually, that's about um, gathering money this year. So it's a way of collecting money. And we are sold out next year. That shows how important it is for people to actually be a part of it. And people are really supporting this do-it-yourself festival. So hopefully, we will have a fair amount of money to donate. They, the money we get from this is 100% given further on to donate the money. Your other wouldn't be able to donate in. Um, so that's kind of, yeah, we hope. It'll be good, but we don't know. We will see next. We don't want to listen too much to the police officers who said, well, we don't think there's going to be lots of next. <laughs> I'd rather listen to Dan. Morton, thank you. I won't be one of those wristbands. I can just see myself dancing around the lounge here. Uh, Pascal, can I come to you one last time? Uh, I mean, we are drawing to an end. Um, so given Switzerland's view of the pandemic, how has the country been treating events differently from others? And why is this? And, and can we learn something from Switzerland? In Switzerland, in Switzerland, the, the official decision were announced in line with the principle of transparency about the scientific lack of evidence. And the key sentence of the Minister of Health is now very famous all over the country. We must act as speed as possible, but as slow as necessary. <laughs> very Swiss. Um, <laughs> meaning, the meaning taking into account the risk perception of the population and the compliance uh, to the measures. And a good measure, which is not a black, uh, apply, applicable, uh, becomes a bad uh, measure. Um, I would say, um, the, 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 we can consider the, the crisis as a crisis of, the, of science, actually. The controversies around the scientific knowledge, um, which is usually hidden in the backstage uh, of scientists, uh, has been exposed in the public debates. So is it recommended to use um, uh, to wear a mask or not? Do we have to fear about the second wave? Is chloroquine a good medical treatment and so on? Um, so um, everybody could see how instable the science is facing with the new virus. And this has a, an impact of the political decision because science, uh, scientific expertise uh, used to be a compass for, for uh, official uh, decision. And um, probably now, um, in line with uh, the Swiss government philosophy, it's, it's time to uh, rehabilitate uh, the population itself as an actor of the situation. Um, it's, it's, very, um, um, it's very interesting to see uh, in such a context of um, uh, contradictory injections uh, to see how uh, people can adapt. Uh, the population uh, seems, I don't know how it is um, everywhere else, but in Switzerland, more or less, the people are complying with health regulations. Um, it, you know, the, the, the population um, it, it become the barometer uh, with behavior following more or less the evolution of the epidemic uh, in an almost natural way. So the lesson learned is, is very democratic in the end of the day. Uh, the crisis manager will gain uh, maybe in uh, relevance to their strategy to consider the decision, the, the population uh, as an actor uh, in risk assessment and prevention measures, and not only considering it as a spectator uh, of a crisis that would be so serious and complex that it would need to be delegated to a, a, an higher uh, authority. So um, that's, that's maybe um, uh, something we can think about uh, for the future. Uh, I, I like uh, the sentence uh, in um, the EHC guidance, we are all in this together, uh, meaning we are all in the same boat and only collectively uh, we can find a solution uh, to, to the crisis. Um, thinking about an even context, it's, it's key to be able to communicate the measures uh, in a very uh, clear and transparency uh, way uh, in order to, to have a compliance from, from the attendees and to make not only compliant, but also actor uh, of this. Otherwise, we will not be able to, to manage the situation. Pascal, thank you. 
We've heard quite a bit from um, Paleo and Ross Kilda. I do have a question. Oh, sorry, Alex has a question to, uh, to Liam, Danielle, and Sam. Do you think, uh, do you have confidence that there will be a festival calendar next year in the UK? Anyone want to pick that up? Yeah, I think there will be. Um, um, just purely based on what we're obviously looking at. So the other part of AEG, AEG Live, they run obviously quite a lot of festivals. So British Summertime, all of that sort of stuff. So yes, we are looking to have festivals next year. Great, fantastic news. Uh, there's a couple of questions in, one from Hans. Um, in the Netherlands yesterday, uh, the Prime Minister announced a lot of new rules that makes it possible to start with events. In which way is England looking at the rules in Holland? Uh, Liam, I've talked about looking more broadly uh, across the world, but is anyone looking at the uh, the Dutch rule? Anyone want to admit to that? Um, we are. Um, every time we, we see new rules coming up elsewhere, we, we quickly study just to see um, how we would implement them on our side of things. Um, as as we all know, our government seemed to come out with one rule, then go back on it, and then slightly change it, and um, it gets very, very confusing. Um, so it is worthwhile when we're talking to the venues. We've got good relationships with the guys at Ajax uh, and at the stadium there, um, at the Amsterdam, um, and they're good people. And, you know, they've always been people that are, are looking ahead and develop really well. So talking to them to see how they would implement it, it gives us clues on what we would do. And then that's the important thing because our interpretation of it is one thing and listening to somebody else's interpretation and you need to do that. And I think the listening side of it is really important and because they, they know their own challenges. But it's what I said earlier on about the environment outside, how it can differ. Um, and that environment is down to your government and for us, DCMS and SGSA on, on whether they stay quiet or whether they turn around and say, is a new part to the Green Guide. So for the Green Guide, for those who don't know, it is our Bible. Um, and they keep saying they'll send us an updated version. So for us, it's really important to see what other nations are doing because I think at times we're behind the curve with guidance from above. So learning what other people do allows us to feed back into these bodies above us. And I think that communication is really important. We have to manage up and, and we're managing up on learning from other people and what other nations are doing. Um, and then pushing it forward. We are aware of the different challenges, or if they've got a better interpretation on how to make that work for a live event, then it's really down to us to manage up to these people to say, okay, you may not be talking to these people, we are, and listen to how they're doing things. So yeah, we are definitely watching. Brilliant, Liam, thank you. There's one more question, and if you, if you want to pose your question, please do that now. This is from George, uh, and George seems to be in the know here. Uh, is the event sport petition debate in the Commons this afternoon likely to bring any positive outcome? Mass gatherings are now in t uh, are routinely occurring on streets and beaches around the UK. Seemingly the only thing missing is the entertainment factor. Yeah, we, we're expecting news tomorrow. So we've got meetings tomorrow. I've seen um, little snippets of paperwork that started floating around today. Um, as I said earlier, there's an SGSA meeting where they're inviting all of their um, sporting bodies to on Thursday. So I think they feel something's going to be said. Now, I have a feeling they're not in control of what's going to be said. So we're all going to be chasing um, the same thing when it when the news does come out. But there's definitely been pressure and a lot of lobbying that's been going on in the background towards the government, hence the, the drop to one metre from, from our sector. Um, so yeah, we, we're expecting something to come out, but I'll be quite honest, we're not quite sure what it will be, and hence the meetings have been set up as reactive meetings to go, and here we go again. Um, <laughs> the, the hard thing for us will be then our chairman and CEOs who, who are not operators, um, and God bless them, they will be putting pressure on us to go, well, the government have said, it's like, I know, but please let us react to it first. So yeah, I do think something's going to come out this afternoon, I just don't know what. Liam, thank you. And George, uh, watch this space. Let us know. Uh, yeah. The question, Sam, for you, uh, this is from Douglas. Um, following on from Sam's comment about working with security and crowd management companies that plan for reopening, how do you see this working for venues and events that don't have a team in place? Sam, what do you think? Sorry, Toby. Was the question what might happen if, if venues do not have a security team in place? Was that yes. the question? 
yeah, how do you see it working for venues that don't have a team like you have in place, uh, Liam and Daniel and everyone else? Um, I think for me, I think probably most people on, on this webinar probably do have teams in place. Um, I mean, the advice that I would give is that, you know, to take advice from somebody who is is competent or or has knowledge and, you know, even if you write your own guidance and have your own um, procedures in place, I would honestly say get someone to have a look through that and make sure that, you know, you're, you're not missing things. I think somebody mentioned, you know, we usually um, in the past have done pat downs for, for some events or some gigs or maybe even every single um, uh, every single event at Wembley Stadium. And what's the guidance now? Because we've had the, the same information from the Met Police that actually you can't do pat downs now. So what are you going to put in place? And I would say um, gather as much information as you can. Um, not not from the sun, as, as Chris said, but actual <laughs> official and formal information. Write your plan and then test it. Get somebody to look through it. Um, go to another venue, you know, go. Um, Danielle said, you know, the, the parts of the O2 are open now. Go see what see what other people have got in place. Write your plan and then test it. And, and I know that people at the moment aren't blessed with a lot of money, but I would genuinely say get get a professional to look over it and see that it's on on track. And and, and that would be and actually, do you know what, as well, there's a lot of people at the moment who are giving guidance for for free. And there's notes on LinkedIn. You know, if you need a bit of help, shoot shoot me a bit of information, you know, shoot me your plan, I'll have a look through and give you help where I can. And I would say, take advantage of that at the moment. Um, we, we are all in this together, as Pascal said, and people are willing to help each other because we don't want to get it wrong. So write your plans, um, take best practice from other people, use information wherever you get it, and, um, you know, just visit other people who are doing this at the moment and uh, use their best practice. That would be my advice. Can, could I add to that as well? Because we don't have an in-house team at Wembley, but what we did, um, we hired a professional. Um, as far as I'm concerned, my crowd safety manager is important as a medic, as a uh, electrician. It's an integral part of your operation. So I think if you don't um, have a company working within your house, I think you do need that sort of senior crowd safety manager. I've got a general called Stu Doyle, who we managed to pinch from Twickenham um, and he is exceptional and he really is and he's so important for that exactly what Sam said of that information it's integral but you need to have somebody in there it's, it is beyond relevant and it and it will never change so for me I think if you're looking at your budgets and looking at your staffing going forward not to have somebody within your house whether it's a team or whether it's a company but definitely to have a person in there assigned to that task is it gives you so much reassurance at the top end that you've got that person or that team looking at it. It's an essential part of your delivery now. Brilliant. So, Douglas, hopefully that's some good, uh, good, useful advice for you. Chris, over to you. Uh, it's really interesting listening to you all today because um, working with a lot of dance schools and in the dance environment as well, which we do a lot of work in, um, the biggest thing at the moment is lobbying, lobbying the government, lobbying the DCMS, lobbying anybody they can to get the answer out of them. And the, the thing that's really interesting is, as you go through looking at what's happening, so many people have no idea what's happening in their sector. And gradually, this week, things have started to appear, the names like dance schools, pubs, clubs, all the different things, and what they are, how they're affected, et cetera. Now, this could have happened before, but they weren't sure <clears throat> of what was going on. And I think that lobbying and the guidance that's gradually coming out will, will set us up for taking things back to some sort of new normal. But it's going to take time. The reason people are scurrying at the moment is because too many people want to do things and it's too dangerous to do them. So it's been quite difficult looking at that and how it's going to happen. Also, some of the guidance is interchangeable. Don't throw away a piece of guidance that's for a stadium or that's for um, a small theatre because you can take bits from it because when we've been working with partners, been looking at different pieces of guidance, take the best practice and use that within those areas because it's a good thing to do. Well, I'd like to thank everybody who's joined us on this um, webinar, the COVID-19 one, um, especially the venues, events, festivals that have given up their time to speak today. I mean, everybody here, Thank you so much for giving up your time because it means a great deal, not just to us who are putting these events on, but to those people who are there listening. 
because it gives them hope, it gives them ideas, and it gives them things they can understand that they can then turn into practice and deliver in their own venues. And I think that's been really, really important. Um, I think the other thing about this as well is that over the four sets that we've had, we've had so many people come onto them. It's been really brilliant. And we've had so many people email in and say what a great session they were. And it's not us who's presented them that make it a great session. It's you guys that are giving the answers. So thank you very much for that. Um, and for those of you who've been coming in, I hope we've been able to answer some of your key concerns. Uh, back over to you, Toby. Thank you, Chris and Alex. Thank you for your uh, comments there. So yeah, we're, we're going to get together later on this year and hopefully throughout the next year, Chris and I to do more events like this. So please stay tuned with us. We hope you got something from this one. If you're watching the recording, you missed a fantastic event. So thank you very much indeed for your time today. And we look forward to seeing you at some point in the future. Thank you very much.